can you hear us, sir? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Ah, there we go. We got you. How you doing, bud? I'm, we're, we've been watching along with uh, what you've got going on here. Yeah, I was. Uh, uh, I spent a little time watching you guys' interview because I, I hadn't seen those sketches of George's. <laughs> Are those great? Yeah. I loved his uh, high school cars. I got to look at this. <laughs> yeah. From high school cars to the new uh, flying ships in Blade Runner. Amazing. Yeah, he's been holding out on me, man. Yeah, he's, he's got the goods. I got I, I to gotta talk to him about that. Uh, well, give us a little rundown on uh, what you're doing here. Yeah, what, what are we looking at? We got Greebles uh, here and... I, no, I mean, I, you, you pretty much are looking at, like, I was trying to pick something from every piece. Um, so I, <laughs> I think I'm doing some kind of hanger, uh, it looks like, but I'm not quite sure, you know, what it is yet. Um, just I, I, I figured, well, why don't I try to put all the pieces together as much as possible? You are setting um, the bar high, my friend. Uh, Amazing. Just, play with it and see, see what comes <laughs> I don't really know right now I, I love this I remember in the uh, in the, the first time we ever streamed together which was almost a year ago um, we had four kits out we had our launch kits and you were the first person to take all four of those kits and bash them together really oh yeah okay I didn't know that <laughs> um, I've got a question uh, that maybe we can help clarify for the audience who may not know um, what is kit bashing? Well, kit bashing really literally started a long, long time ago when they were making like models, um, like real models. Um, and they would buy a whole bunch of models and uh, they would just take parts and start gluing them together to create cooler shapes. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of started, you know, kit bashing. Um, and you know, it's evolved obviously, you know, from analog to digital and it's just really a, a, basically getting a whole bunch of parts and uh, putting them together in ways that wasn't intended um, and coming up with some really interesting results. And, yeah, you know, we'll, as we break this down, you'll see, you know, a lot of these parts weren't meant to be like turned or, you know, pulled or, you know, put into different ways. Uh, but you know, it works. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the most famous examples of this is the Millennium Falcon, um, you know, from Star Wars it, and the Death Star. You know, they went out and got different model shop kits for different cars or trains or tanks or whatever. And they broke apart all the little pieces that you're supposed to glue together to create the tank and instead started putting them together in all these weird ways to create these science fiction looking spaceships. Mm -hmm. And and that was originally they were doing that with actual physical models. Yes, you know, we're here. We're we're in three D. One of the other options of or examples of kit bashing that I love is a transformer. You know, is oh yeah, is a car and a robot kit bashed together. Yeah, yeah, completely. You're taking a bunch of the car pieces and bashing them together to create this robotic character. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so, Eman, walk us through uh, walk us through a little bit of uh, of what you built here. You've got a you've got a massive scene. Yeah, so uh, I'm just trying to make this sort of hangar like thing with these big ships that I, I still got to put some parts in. But uh, so here's the here. Let me get closer. So I mean, I, I'm taking a whole bunch of stuff and kind of laying out. Um, you know, something that works for mainly this vantage point right around here. Ugh, there you go. And so it's just kind of this, you know, maybe rail system slash hanger thing um, that's happening. Um, and just, you know, pulling in all the kits and seeing what shapes make sense. I mean, right now, this is more thinking about shapes, um, and, you know, when I start a render, you'll see the light uh, in there, uh, which will help define, you know, and push things forward and backwards. But basically, I'm just trying to put together something that looks interesting. Um, and there's so many interesting shapes. I'm just trying to tie them together so they, they don't look like they don't belong. They look, you know, they, they actually look like they belong together. Mm -hmm. And if if I'm not mistaken, those are Art Deco buildings turned on their side, right? To make yeah, your spaceships. Yeah. So that's that. And then, um, 
Art Deco, there's uh, Industrial, Griebel, really big. You know, the Griebel is supposed to be small, but actually it works really big. Um, so that's Griebel right there. Uh, is that Vic, is that a Gothic turned on its side underneath it, underneath yeah. those bridges? Yeah, so it's it's a really cool aesthetic that I actually think it's you know can be explored even more. Um, but it, it, yeah, I, I really liked that aesthetic. So yeah. that's awesome. Mm. Uh, but I mean, I, you know, there's like a little bit of everything in here, uh, and then there's Egypt back there. So, but what you'll see is that you know it looks like a a little bit of a mess right now. But uh, and then there's also I don't know what arches these are. Oh, that I, is amazing. Um, but so let me just save and do a real qu quick sort of GPU. Uh, let's see. Let's see how how this handles. <laughs> yeah, just for for those of you who are watching who haven't uh, used three D before, um, basically what's happening right now is Eman's been blocking this whole thing out. Uh, in the actual software, but in order to work fast, he's not using uh, lighting or textures or material. Uh, if something would have, uh, you know, a wood texture or a metal texture, um, that's hidden for now so that he can speed up his workflow and be able to just place things. And then uh, once he's had his scene set and he knows kind of what the, what the composition is going to be, what pieces are going to go where, he'll hit render. And what that'll do is start to calculate all the lighting um, I, either sunlight or actual lamps or anything, any lights that he actually put in the scene. And then it'll also start to paint all of the materials, the woods, the metals, the golds, things like that. Um, so we're looking at a gray shaded render right now. Um, and yeah. when we hit render, we'll get to see what it actually looks like with all the materials and the lighting. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what, what's going on, which that's a big step of what happens. So we just hide some stuff. And Close so them. what you guys are seeing is his render window and Emet is this B ray? Yeah. So and yeah, so so what it, it, it gives you a look into the grayscale world in real time, which this is GPU uh, processing power is a new format and only in the last couple of years has come on and really elevated the way that rendering power and processing time has shrunk down. I mean, how long would it have taken to get to look at an image like this 10 years ago? Oh my God, I remember 10 years ago, you know, the process was you'd place a light, you'd hit render, you'd come back 15, 20 minutes later, and you'd only render the bottom left corner. And you'd be like, okay, does this look good? No, it doesn't. Let me turn the light, hit render, wait 15, 20 minutes, come back. Um, and also one of the big advancements of all of this is that uh, 10 years ago, we had to place a light, let's say sunlight's coming through a window. You'd place the light and then that light is gonna hit the ground and the ground is gonna reflect the light back up. So you'd place another light on the ground pointed back up at the ceiling. And then that light actually hits the ceiling and bounces back down. So you'd put another light on the ceiling bouncing back down. So you'd be tracing light rays of how they would bounce around a room in order to get a realistic looking scene. Um, today we call that global illumination. You know, that's really the idea that a light just doesn't just hit a source and then stop, but it actually illuminates from that source as well. Um, and that's something that used to take a lot of manual time to set up and then even more time to actually render. And today we have GPU renderers or game engines now even that can do that in real time. Um, you know, one of the things with there's a there's a gap right now between game engines that are running 60 frames per second and GPU rendering, which still takes a couple seconds to render. Um, the difference really here is in a game engine, you're sacrificing a lot of quality. Um, it's getting better and better and you're uh, able to sacrifice less and less these days and it's it's only going to get better. Um, but in order to get really completely photorealistic scenes, uh, the stuff that you'd actually use for either a game cinematic or a full feature film when something needs to look 100% real, um, those kinds of effects are without sacrifice. So you need to use an actual render engine that's capable of doing that. And that's something like V-Ray or Octane or Redshift um, or RenderMan. There's a ton of different render engines and those are like separate programs that plug into your 3D program. And if all this seems like a ton, 
don't worry. Um, what, what essentially it's the, there's a 3D and a GPU revolution happening right now in digital art, and the types of tools that are are being made available to to the visual effects and concept art world have not been available now and have not been available in the past. Um, so it's a very exciting time to be to be working with tools like this um, and getting to see how much faster you can make an image. Well, and also, you know, 20 to 30 years ago, you would need a computer that costs $50,000 to $100,000 to be able to run any of these software. Now we can run them on a, on a laptop. Um, the, the actual entry point of being able to have the hardware at home that you can make these kinds of images and software now that you can afford at home or is even free, um, things like Blender, which is completely free, or even Unreal Engine 4, which is free. Um, these sorts of tools being able to be in the hands of everyone means that we now have this ability where we can all be creating digital worlds and we can all have a chance to take the ideas and stories in our heads and actually make them into realities. Um, and that's why we're so excited to be able to share this stuff with you and, and show you some of the artists that have been doing this at the highest level uh, for a long time, um, but also showing how they actually go about creating an image and hopefully inspire some of you guys to give it a shot. So then well, E-Man, your I, yeah, I see your your window here. Um, are you gonna is, are you gonna set on that frame, or are you gonna poke around in in your engine? Um, I I mean I'm I'm still playing, you know, like trying to to get something, you know, like right now. I think this is a, uh, a an angle that could work. So maybe I'm thinking uh, these are like futuristic trains, um, mm. you know, and give them a lot of tracks and you know, maybe have a little bit of a down view kind of like this, but have more rows going down, you know, like I'm just kind of going with what, what comes, mm -hmm. uh, and have these areas kind of be like, uh, the, the, the platforms, you know, and you, maybe you ride an elevator down to the ground level. Um, you know, it's a real sort of hazy environment. We can do that in, you know, in Photoshop too, which I'll probably jump onto for, for the last 15 minutes or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that could work. You know, that's something that could be cool. Um, yeah, Wait, so that's kind of where I'm leaning now. <laughs> to to catch the audience up, if you guys um, are just joining us, thank you very much for for coming in to to hang with us. Um, e man here uh, is making an image in two hours here live. Um, and so this is the Kibash 3D Festival, and we are very happy to be only on Twitch and in between the Bob Ross Marathon. So Bob Ross Marathon ends at 8 p.m. We come on and ferry you guys from one Bob Ross fix to the next at 10 p.m. Um, and so in that period of time, we are going to be showing digital art and how art in 3D uh, can be uh, is being used in today for movies and video games. Um, and so E-Man here is a concept artist. He has worked on Ready Player One, Blade Runner, literally every superhero movie you can Deadpool, think of. Deadpool, Game of Thrones. Um, I mean, yeah. That, you know what? I, I have Do a, you have the list? I, I got a list. We got, re, this is just in the last decade, the last 15 years. Ready Player One, Blade Runner, The Predator, Alien, Thor, Deadpool, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Amazing Spider-Man, Cosmos, Elysium, Star Trek, Captain America, Iron Man, Superman, Harry Potter, Sin City, Hellboy, Game of Thrones, and Pacific Rim. So, that's who we're hanging out Never with. Never heard here. of it. Never heard of it. Never <laughs> heard of it. Um, that's who we're hanging out with. And before our eyes in this two-hour period, E-Man has to finish an image. So, E-Man, you, um, you, you started working in 3D. You're, he's working through his block out, um, and then he's going to find his, using his render engine, which is V-Ray, he's going to set his lighting, and then he's going to export to, like he just said, he might finish in Photoshop. So he'll then take this, once he sets an image and decides on a frame after putting his, his Lego type pieces in place, um, he will then take that into Photoshop, and then he'll paint on top of it. And, and just to make sure we got this right, because we got a question in the chat, uh, E-Man, did you start off with any sketches or thumbnails? It looks like you just winged this, right? That's a great question. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't suggest that. Very confident <laughs> artist there. Seasoned but, and you know, confident. It's just, some things you just do for fun, but I mean, uh, you know, and tonight it's just having some fun. But, uh, and I've, you know, kid bash enough with these kids to kind of know what they can give me. But 
I, I would also say that, you know, like if you really want to get better, uh, it is a good idea to generally, you know, sketch out or block out at least a rough idea of what you want. You don't have to be able to draw well, um, but you just, you know, you need to have a, a, a little bit of an idea of um, where you're going. But I've kind of played enough with this kits that I'm, I feel like I can just kind of do something mm. and it won't be hard. <laughs> one of the things i love about watching you work is it just feels like you're playing it just it always looks like you're just having fun with it and playing yeah totally so these are probably going to be the pods of where like people come in and then they go to the you know their train and then so now which means i mean form follows function so in the end after you've been doing it for so long you know so there's a train so this is a some kind of sci-fi train that needs it needs some kind of track so that's a, the next thing I'll do, you know, to make a little sense out of it. Mm -hmm. But as you pull together these things to make sense, then it starts feeling more real. Um, and I think, you know, the lighting is kind of, I think it looks kind of cool like that, yeah. you know. I mean, we could do a lot to it, but I was like, well, okay, that's, that's a good starting place. Um, and then maybe there's a main station sort of back here or something, you know. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to, keep going and then see, you know, I'm looking at the clock. I got a clock in front of me. Um, but, you know, you, you know, when you're working, you, you kind of have to get used to that too, you know, because, you know, I don't know about you, Max, but, you know, I've had production designers that literally call me up like, hey, okay, that's three hours have gone by. What, what, have, you, what have you got? And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I always oh, feel yeah. like whenever I'm working for a client or doing a project, that it's uh it's like fast and the furious it's just um or you know gone in 60 seconds is probably a better analogy uh well, as soon as i get the brief it's just like okay and you know green light go and you're just like you are on a time limit you are racing the clock uh you got to come up with generate a lot of ideas very quickly uh, but all of them have to be good images still to be able to sell the idea um you know i think i think speed is something for me, that's been very important in, in, in my workflow. Um, Eman, do you feel like you have, like, when, when you're doing work for a client, does it feel like you're under the gun or do you feel like you get some, some clients that let you play and explore? Well, I think, you know, fast and the furious is definitely a good description because they want you to be fast or else they'll be furious. So <laughs> it's, because that's, that's the name of the game right now. I think a lot of people just, it's just like they look at their clock and fast, fast, fast. And I think it's a little too much, but I do generally try to have fun if I can, you know? And I figure that sometimes if I'm not having fun, you're not gonna get a cool image anyway. So, yeah, you know, try not to pressure myself too much, but you know, you can only try, but sometimes deadlines are deadlines and, you know, they, they get to you and you know that's the problem with the industry sometimes you do a whole bunch of movies that people want stuff really quickly so your work tends you know comes out to be a little subpar and so some projects you you actually don't show um that's happened to me a lot that you just you know it's not a portfolio worthy project and there's some projects that really push you and you know those are the pro you know like blade runner was great you know I was really pushed with a really good production designer uh, with a good crew, you know, like when you have somebody like George, you know, turning in their sketches every day, you got a whole bunch of, you know, you got some healthy competition there. <laughs> yeah. Pretty really good because it pushes you to do something. You're, you're like, yeah, he's my good buddy. But I got to make something cool, man. I can't <laughs> you know, and he had recommended me for the job. So I got to make him look good. Um, you know, so I got to prove it. And so, you know, but, you know, it, it creates better images and it inspires you. And it's good having a good production designer that you can actually have fun with. Yeah. Rare. I think that was always my favorite part about working uh, with a great team and a great project. You know, the great projects usually bring a great team around them um, and just being surrounded and being accountable to other artists who are on the team and feeling like you you need to rise to the occasion, that you don't want to let down the artists next to you. Um, and that that kind of feeling, uh, I always loved it. And, it. and those were the times I felt I always grew the most as an artist was um, when I was surrounded by a team of amazing artists. Um, yeah. You, you kind of need to step up to it. You have no choice but to, be, to grow from there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they, they're just so good, um, you know, and, and you don't want to look bad. <laughs> you know? Well, one of the coolest things about concept art, I think, is the speed. You know, for, for you guys who, who may not have, have participated much in, in how concept art works, they're the first ones to take a script or a brief and bring it to life. So they're the world builders. So the ones who the director will will give them uh, uh, some some uh, uh, maybe just a couple pages out of the script and say, hey, can you turn this into what you might think? And the idea is that you're going to turn that in one day, and then they're going to give notes or change something, and you're going to turn something in new the next day. And so the the process of concept art is super fast. Where for visual effects, it's often a very lengthy process. But once they land on one of your iterations, then everyone will follow that. So from the initial concepts, you can actually see that that, wherever they landed in one of those day-long iterations, is what's going to end up on screen. And a lot of the times you'll take that painting and spend a lot more time on it to actually create it and finish it. Um, Eman work, and I worked together without even knowing it for um, a couple shots for Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Eman had done the initial designs and, and done the fast concepts for it. Um, and then that got handed to me as a matte painter on that project. And with matte painting, the idea is uh, to take an idea and make it look like a photograph. It needs to be completely realistic. And a lot of the times, rather than spending a day on that painting, you'll spend a month on that painting to make sure that every little detail is in there, that when you look at it, it looks like they actually went out and filmed it somewhere. Um, so I, I took that rough sketch from E-Man and then started to go in there and add all the details. And then, you know, I don't know how long he had for that sketch, maybe a day or two. And, and then I went and spent a month with it mm -hmm. to, to polish it up Make into it. All a, the details. Yeah. Are you, are you still matte painting, uh, Max? Uh, you know, I haven't done a matte painting in a long time. Um, Kit Bash keeps me pretty busy. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you, you might do a piece in a couple of weeks here. Uh, yeah, you know, every once in a while, a project calls that I'm, I'm like, okay, this, this would be fun, and if I can, uh, if I can block out time um, to, to sit down and actually get back in there, it's a nice change of pace every once in a while. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw your name on the bill for this festival here. Uh, and I, and I'll be doing, I'll be doing a demo on the festival as well. Um, Ian asked in the chat if I do concept art. It's I'm, I'm known for matte paintings. Uh, what a lot of people like don't know is I, I did all the cons well not all of them but a good chunk of the concepts for the paintings that I would then go and do um, so most of my specialty was let me go spend four weeks on a painting rather than crank out four paintings in a day mm -hmm. um, but each of those paintings a lot of the times had to start with me cranking out four paintings in a day to set the look before I'd go spend all that time on it and for you guys out there if you don't know um, what matte painting is is the the finished process a matte painter works sort of outside of the chain of the visual effects and then comes in right at the end to build the scene. So they're doing all the like very fine details that, that are the world that you see as it finishes on screen. Mm -hmm. All right, so Eman, we've got uh, 47 minutes, sir. Um, Game on. Yeah, yeah. yeah I see you. You're you're d jumping into uh, some future. Well, I'm waiting. Things. I'm waiting for the, I'm waiting for this screen to refresh. Hopefully, we haven't crashed. <laughs> Oh, well, there we go. Back in back in the game. Yeah, I saw and you flipping save. through some future slums as well as some uh, Roman Empire pieces there. You think yeah, about... there's Roman Empire in here. Uh -huh. um, the scene is starting to. I think I'm 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 really taxing it because you know. Uh, but I, actually, I was just um, when I was uh, just taking a look at the chat. Um, Somebody said that it doesn't look like a very fun place to work, the film industry, because <laughs> you know everything moves so quickly. Um, but you know, I I, I actually think that uh, um, I actually don't work very quick, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, I can if I have to, but usually, you know, my best work comes when I actually put some thought to it, um, and I take my time with it, uh, especially my personal art. So, uh, and I think that, you know, with the right production designer, they can appreciate that. So it's not always like fast, fast, fast. It just depends on who you're working with. And I think there's different stages of it too, right? You know, there's, there's a stage where it's important to generate a lot of ideas and to not be precious with the artwork that you're doing because it's not meant to be a beautiful picture. It's meant to be an idea. 
And oh yeah, yeah, and those are yeah. That's you know yeah definitely. But I think it's the pressure that you you know people don't want to feel. You know, like hey man, you got to perform. Um, but they just want to you know be able to just you know do some good work without having all that pressure. And I think you know it's actually you know sometimes it's actually quite fun. I think the the, the pressure. Cool. Um, and I it think just depends on who you're working with. Yeah. That's kind of the difference, you know. If you if you like the slower pace and you want to really get the time to put the attention into detail, working for a visual effects studio in the film industry, um, you know, you really do take your time. You know, some of the paintings that I did for films took three months, maybe six months, to do a painting, and it was really about just making it perfect. And the quality came first, and however long you need to make it perfect. Um, you know, I think, of course, that every industry is going to have good and bad places and people who had good and bad experiences. But I don't think doing a generalization of um, everyone's focused on speed instead of quality is, is fair to a lot of the people out there who really are focused on quality. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think, you know, whenever you have one, you're going to have the other, too. Um, so and, and it's not always. Yeah, it's not always speed. It's, you know, I mean, I think in the end, quality is really what's more important. I think, and, and um, it's it's about finding what part of the business works for you, and what part, yeah, of, yeah, what part of anything speaks to you. And some parts of it, and some jobs are fast, and some some give tons of time. And how, how important do you guys feel that um, repetition, as in, you know, in a disciplined way, is is what helps you get fast? I mean, watching E Man work right now is 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 proof of that. You know, he's he's done so much of not just creating images and understanding composition from all of the images that he's created, but also having played with these kits and knowing his way around 3D and all the time that he's spent is what's allowing him to create a, a very complex scene and a complex image in two hours. Mm. Um, and I know you guys have worked on a ton of games. Andre asks, um, what about what about video games in terms of speed? Um, I, I find video games to be a little bit more chill. Um, and, and I don't know why that is, to be honest with you, because, you know, they're, it's, it's, sometimes their deadlines are a lot more uh, relaxed. Uh, they have a longer cycle, usually. Um, and I, I find them on the, on the whole to be more, more laid back um, for me. Uh, in, in the film stage, when, when I get hired, usually they're trying to, like, go as cheap as possible and then get it as quick as possible so that they're done. Um, and that's, you know, it's a little generalization, but it, it is what happens to me more often than not. Um, so I'm all, usually on a project anywhere from a month to four months and that's it. But on a game, you could easily be on there for like six months to a year, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I, you know, that's a that's a good question. Email questions. Oh, uh, for me, I love working in games. It's been uh, I always wanted to work in games when I was a kid. Um, stumbled into the film industry, but games is where my heart's always been. Um, and the most fun projects and teams I've ever been a part of were were because of games. Um, I thought actually the pacing of games hit a really nice balance for me. Um, it was right in between, for, for my experience, I was working in game cinematics, and uh, which are you know the cutscenes and, and the more narrative aspects of games. Um, Fun. Yeah, and I loved that. And it, it was like, I, I worked in TV, which was very fast, and commercials, which oh, were yeah, very yeah, fast. Yeah, TVs, yeah. And then film and animation, which were very slow. Um, and then games hit this like perfect sweet spot for me. Um, there's a question in the chat about your computer specs. It was only a matter of time, E man. What you got? <laughs> I got this freaking old ass Dell um, Inspiron. Uh, or not uh, Inspiron. What is it? Um, uh, precision. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a it's a Xeon. Uh, it's like four years old. I mean it. You know that's ancient for. I love that that's the old ass computer. It's like four, four years, years old. Four years old. <laughs> yeah, but you know, About four years for us. Yeah. That's old, man. And two ten eighties. Two ten eighty GTX Nvidia's. If you guys. Yeah. Um, Bro, that's yeah, that's it. You know, stuff. nothing. You know, it's not a, like a super duper. Like you know, it's not like what Ash is. You know, has. <laughs> that huh. guy's insane. 
But you GPU know, power is really like that's the power that you need on this computer. That's what allows you to work fast, which is why you've. you've well, it is and it isn't. Uh, it is for the rendering part of it, but for this part, like right, what I'm doing right now, um, you know, it's going to have some hiccups because uh, the CPU will do do a lot of the computations of the file. Um, I don't have a ton of memory. I have like 32 gigs. I mean, I know that doesn't sound like like little, but it is actually um, when you have so much open. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm running at 73 years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but, but, you know, it, it works, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, but I think it, it's going to be time for an upgrade soon. I'll say this uh, in terms of that, that question of, um, you know, what kind of hardware do you need to do this kind of stuff? Um, what I always did throughout my career is, uh, you know, you never have the hardware that you want. There's always a faster machine out there. Um, what I did was I, I started with not great hardware. And as I started getting freelance jobs, the first thing I invested in was my equipment. Um, and so if I got a job, I would buy uh, a new SSD or I got a job, then I'd buy another graphics card. And I started to slowly upgrade my machine over the course of years. Um, and I still do this once a year, you know, at the beginning of the new year, I decide what's the part of my computer that I, uh, that I wanna change out or upgrade. And I do it one part at a time. Um, so I, I haven't bought a new computer since I was, I don't know, 18 years old, um, but there's no original parts left in it. It's just, you know, <laughs> Finally got a new case five years ago. Wait, like, it's the same computer? What? Yeah, like I just one by one, you know, I'd replace the CPUs, I replaced the GPUs, I replaced the hard drives, I replaced the case, the cooler, the you know, all of that stuff. So it's like my whole computer is a constant recycling machine. You know, take out the oldest part each year and add a newer one. A lot under the hood. A lot under the hood. <laughs> um, that's the kind of stuff, you know, you don't, you don't need to know a ton about computers to do this stuff uh, in terms of being able to build computers or I, I could not build a computer to save my life. Um, you know, I luckily have fr friends who are very good at that and they just kind of take care of it all and let me know what the, uh, what the price tag is going to be. Yeah, I can. I, I won't. I won't even. I mean, I, that's why I have a Dell because I, I, you know, if something's wrong, I don't want to fix it. Mm. I mean, I'll just make it more wrong. So I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, call somebody. Yeah, help! I need an adult. <laughs> yeah, help! I need. I just need this, and then they go, um, yeah, are you sure you didn't just do this? And then you go, oh, okay. What's uh, what's the thought process of what you're doing right now? You're just, are you just filling in this bottom layer right now, or adding details? What's What's going on in your head? Uh, well, right now I'm just, you know, I, I see this part that could easily be, you know, like a, you know, on, on trains where there could be a break or something, you know, anything to add a little bit of detail so that when you see it, you kind of believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, now it's just, it's just feeling like these tracks going out, you know, I, you know, I wanted to quick, put a quick terminal there and see how that feels, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I'm trying, I'm going to try to bend one of these pieces so the tracks go that way so that you know you have a uh maybe a like something pointing your eye to I, I don't know you might not need it um down here it's getting you know I, I'll, I'll i'll have to jump into lighting really soon just to see how it lights and then bring it into photoshop i mean i think there's an image that, that that's gonna need some uh you know need some finishing time but um it's definitely i think already you know i think i know where i want to go with it but it's just it's gonna take time, um, and it's not the lightest scene. I gotta figure yeah. out what goes on back here. So, well, you got my... no pressure. You got forty-five minutes. No, you got you got, you got thirty-six minutes. I did my <laughs> math wrong. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man. Well, I, I've been watching this chat, and I am I I love it. It's so cool for us. You know, we we stream usually uh, weekly, and Eman often uh, once a month will stream with us. And it, it's so cool to see so many familiar names here, and we've gotten to to get to know these people and and getting to see you guys talk to one another. I saw Arthur saying what's up to Kalina just a minute ago, and it's so awesome to just have you all here in the room with us um, on this big event for us, where we're we're taking uh, the the message and so and some of the things and skills that we've been working on together over the last year and getting to show it to a larger audience here with Twitch and the the Bob Ross Marathon. It's really cool to 
to have so many familiar faces in the room with us. So thank you all for being here with us. What's up, Polina? What's up, Ian? What's up, Droke? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so cool. And uh, and hello to all of the new faces here. Yeah, um, come hang don't out. Don't be shy. Uh, ask questions in the chat. Um, you know, this really, for us, we we use Kitbash as, um, you know, and especially Kitbash on Twitch, as a way to connect you with amazing artists out there and amazing artists who are designing the top uh, games and movies that are coming out constantly. And um, and so Eban, uh, if you're just joining us, is concept artist from Blade Runner, Deadpool, Captain America, you name it, um, Game of Thrones. So uh, he's worked on a ton of amazing projects, um, kind of showing us his workflow and how he plays around with 3D um, and, and giving us some insights into, uh, into his career and, and his thought process. And to, to that point, you know, our mission here at Kibash 3D is to enable and inspire artists. And we, we do that, we hope, with uh, the kits that we make. Um, we hope that they enable and inspire you to make awesome things. But also with the, the community that we're so fortunate to be part of here, we want to find different ways to, to get us excited and get us pumped up about this amazing career path or hobby, if it's that for you, um, that is digital art. And this is an integral part, the world building of our favorite movies and games, or literally any movie and game, that, that you can be part of too. And there are, there are tools readily available at your fingertips that you may not have known about um, that you can jump in and be taking advantage of and making some really cool stuff. Yeah, if you guys use 3D already, you can grab a sample kit on kitbash3d.com so you can start to play around with some of these Lego pieces. Um, if you guys have never used 3D before, uh, there are software out there like Blender, which is a free software so you can start to uh, get your hands in there and start to play with it. Um, it's super fun. I think uh, I think it's going to be really exciting, especially, you know, I see all these people making the most ridiculously amazing, intricate things in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, Minecraft, I feel like, is really like today's version of Legos when we were kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm so looking forward to all the people who have honed their skills in that, who are ready to kind of graduate to the next level of that, which is using 3D and kit bashing pieces together to create scenes that actually could be used to design uh, tomorrow's AAA games and blockbuster films. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, um, I think also for these uh, kits, uh, you know, I think I, I've seen so much good stuff come out of, uh, you know, all the people's renderings and all that kind of stuff. Um, but one thing I, I think, you know, I want to encourage people to do with these kids, especially is to do stuff that it wasn't intended. Um, because that's really, mm -hmm. really what's fun about kid bashing. Because, yeah, we know we can make, you know, any kit, you know, like the Art Deco kit or whatever. You know, we know that, you know, you can make, you know, the, you know that thing, right? You can make an Art Deco city or, or stuff like that. But what if you were to do something different? Uh, what would that feel like? And, you know, it, it could be a whole new, you know, challenge and, and fun, you know, to create something new. So yeah, totally. I, I think it's yeah really cool. Uh, this is that's what this kid these kids have you know, like you know I mean I wouldn't normally think to put these shapes together if I didn't have the kids. It's truth, you know. Yeah, I I love when people get really creative with how to use this. I mean that is what the foundation of kit bashing means, really. You know, for going yeah, back I mean, to the yeah. Star Wars days and how they designed spaceships by taking tanks and cars and plastering them together in weird and unique ways. Um, or even using, you know, the pieces, if you guys haven't used a model kit before, it usually comes in this little plastic sheet that holds all the pieces together and you kind of pop the pieces out and then are supposed to glue those together to create whatever vehicle or, you know, house or whatever. Um, but a lot of the times people that use the, the, the sheet that it came in after popping everything out, the weird little things that hold all the pieces together. And that would become the rails or the landing gear for all these spaceships that we've now see as iconic designs. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, like you've taken the Art Deco buildings and turned them on their, on their side to, to create these futuristic looking trains. Um, you know, I, I'm sure so many uh, designs that we know of today were, have mm -hmm. come, come together and, and, 
we're thought up in that weird way. Yeah. And I think it's, we are a sum of our experiences. And I think that's, that goes directly into the kind of art that we create. And we, we take things that we've, we've seen something from, from this, you know, visual spice rack and, and you turn it into to something of your own. Um, I love that on, on that note, that George Hole was talking about seeing like a, a, a monkey wrench or, you know, some uh -huh. a doorknob, a doorknob mm -hmm. and being like, oh, that's an interesting shape. Can I incorporate that kind of shape language into a vehicle for Guardians of the Galaxy or um, Blade Runner? You know, finding things out in the world that you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, that should be the design of mm -hmm. a car. Um, finding inspiration that really everywhere. A, yeah, that guy's a true designer. And he's awesome. Well, it's cool hearing about his industrial design background. And I, I love hearing both you guys and so many artists who come talk with us about how important it is to think about the practical use of the thing you're designing. Because it's, it's one thing to, to build something, you know, fantastically sci-fi, um, but it's another for that thing to have very practical reasons why each part of it uh, is designed that way for the the humans or or whoever is interacting with it and using that thing. Yeah, well, form, form follows function, right? Right. And and we've kind of seen that throughout this whole little thing of like, you know, we 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 might not be able to tell yet, but E man's like adding a little thing. And he's like, oh, well, this is a doorway where people would walk out of so they could get on the train. And this over here, well, it needs a braking system and all. Like, mm -hmm. he has a story in his head that's so much right. more intricate than anything we'll ever know. But because he has that story and he's putting the those types of details around it, when we look at it, well, it'll make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll go, oh. I understand that this is a real place because all of the details that I might not even notice, they're they're not missing. They're there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, like, you know, if you didn't have these guys here, uh, you know, just if you didn't have like this, then you kind of think, well, how do they get to the, if this is a train or something, you know, how do they get to it, you know? Um, and then, you know, of course, this thing needs a rail uh, or, you know, maybe it's futuristic enough that it doesn't have it, but with a rail, you, you know, we understand what it is. So sometimes even when you do as sci-fi as you can, it needs something to ground, you know, so that you can look at it and go and, and understand what you're looking at. Um, mm. So, you know, cause you could easily say, ah, oh, it's levitating. Yeah. You could say that and you, it, it, you know, you could be right, but um, sometimes I like to put in stuff that actually um, feels a little bit more grounded so that you know people can understand and 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 you know it's just this one has a little bit of a sci-fi antique feel which you know it's cool i like it Let's see we got some some oh. questions in the chat um well for first uh omids take taking off going to sleep thank you for uh for hanging out with us tonight um he says i i hope to catch more of this channel um you can always do that by just following uh up here it is a, a free follow um and you'll get notified when we are doing more of this stuff um or you can join us on instagram oh yeah that's a, that's a good point if you if you just want to check out um digital art uh consistently um, and want to see how uh some of these kits are are being made into renders of all different kinds um check out the instagram uh kibash 3d um interact with us there too um we're posting uh, cool stuff that people are making with the kids all the time. Um, so uh, check us out there as well. Um, and Top then... Spot brought up a great one. ILM stole a lamppost light near their shop, <laughs> I guess for some sort of kit bashing purposes. Um, and uh, Worst Harbor goes, I want to make this my career. You know, if, if, if that becomes a thing for you, please... Uh, Please let us know and let us uh, let us in, be involved in that journey for you. Um, I think this is one of the coolest possible career choices one could make if this speaks to you. Um, and we we hope to inspire you all to 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 seek those things and to to seek more of yourselves and push yourselves and and grow as as artists and however that works out for you. Um, so if you if if you have seen something here that that strikes your fancy and you're like I want to go for it, uh, please. Uh, jump on that feeling. I think it's a, a really cool thing to do. Well, and, and we have a whole s s bunch of videos we did just for that purpose. <laughs> Literally, speak, speak, that's a great point, Eman. Um, 
you know, if you go onto our YouTube channel, um, Kibash 3D, you can see a bunch of the past streams that that Iman and I have done about um, how to be a professional concept artist. Um, I know I've seen it several times in the chat here. Um, people asking what what can Kibash 3D do to help help them build a career in this field. Um, and on this show, we do a ton of of that kind of stuff. You know, um, Iman came up with this brilliant idea for a show. He's like, everyone's always talking about the art, but what about the business? You know, and the business side of this, especially when so many of us are freelancers, the business side of this is something sort of an elliptical Moby. It's hard to, hard to discuss, or most people don't want to talk about it. And so on that show with E-Man once a month, um, he is so gracious to give us his time and spread some of uh, uh, the great knowledge he has from working on, you know, many, many, many dozens of, of AAA movies and games. Um, so you can check out that. Uh, so there's all there's all sorts of places that we are uh, putting out energy and trying to engage and be a resource for you guys. Um, and the the more you guys communicate with us, the more active you are in the chat. Um, the the emails we get are just so so incredible about people who um, have found some source of inspiration here and are are tackling something new and and seeking to to do uh, to to push themselves and to be better than we were yesterday. I like this idea that. The goal is not to be good, um, and getting to interact with so many artists like Eman and George and Max, of course, everyone all takes such great pride in being better than they were yesterday and looking for new ways to improve and looking for the the taking some some time to learn to learn new software. And Eman, we we've talked a lot about that about how how you consistently trying to to put in new tools into your into your arsenal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're constantly trying to push that. Uh, I mean, for me, it's, you know, new tools. It's, uh, it's, you know, going back to old, old tools, like analog stuff, you know, try to get better at that, you know, it's just anything that gets you better. Yeah, and new mindsets, new philosophies, new things to learn. I feel like yeah, um, to be open enough for that, you need to be, you know, op open. Yeah. And, and I, th I think that's one of our, you know, our big goals with Kip Bash is to push each other to to be uh, better than we than we were yesterday and the best that we can be today. Um, and you know, we try to put a ton of resources out there for artists of all experience levels. You know, if you're if you're just starting out or if you're a seasoned veteran artist, um, you know, we have videos, we do contests, we do challenges. Um, we do a ton to try to build a community that's uh, that's a very ins inspiring place to be, and uh, and a place to learn and a place to improve. Uh, there's still things that come up on our Discord um, or comments in our Instagram where someone will suggest a new tool that I've never heard of or a new way of using something that I've never heard of, and uh, and it opens my eyes all the time to to all the possibilities. Um, I wanted to catch one here. Um, I believe it's Virus VVX. Um, asks, you know, talking about the the idea of super fast sketches and hyper realistic paintings. How would someone like an illustrator fit into that scheme of work? Uh, how would someone like an illustrator fit into doing concept art well, the, or the entertainment industry? Yeah, and, and, well, I, where where I was going to go with that too is um, it's a fantastic question. Um, and our next show, um, we have some incredible illustrators who will be on the show. Um, can we spill the beans about who? The, yeah, we'll, we'll tell you. We'll tell you at the end. We'll tell you, we'll tell you at the end. We'll tell you at the end. We'll tell you at the end. We'll you at the end. Uh, but on our next show, uh, there's going to be we're going to be addressing just that subject with um, two illustrators. Yeah, who so, have uh, uh, an amazing career in the film industry. Bobby Chu and Peter Hunt. <laughs> yeah, Bobby Chu and Peter Hunt will be on the show with us next week. Um, uh, so be be sure to tune in tune in for that one as well. Yeah, and if you don't know Bobby Chu, he's one of the character designers on Alice in Wonderland and a ton of other things. He's one of Tim Burton's designers uh, and runs a school called Schoolism. And Peter Hahn is just an incredible uh, traditional artist. You know, he really loves pen and paper, and uh, teaches at Art Center College of Design as well as having worked on a, a ton of movies and games. Um, but both of those are, are are very much on the illustration side of things and. I think you'll you'll probably get a ton of insights um, from that. Yeah, check check both those guys out on Instagram too if you if you're not uh, familiar with them. Um, but it seems like a lot of y'all in the chat are super DC five. What up, um, E man? Did you did you study art? I've asked you this question um, a ton of times, but I'm I'm gonna do this for the chat. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, I I studied photography first, 
Um, I, I went to art high school and I studied photography for like four years and then I went to art center. Um, and then I didn't quite finish. Uh, and then after that, I went to design school uh, up in Northern California and I graduated with an interior architecture. Interior so, architecture, huh? A little bit of everything. Um, and yeah, so that, so, but photography is still mainly my thing. I think, you know, that's how I think and how I see things, you know, through, through composition, through a lens. Um, so you'll see me always kind of messing around trying to get a, the lens, um, you know, like this is a, I think it's a 50 mil, um, just trying to see, you know, what feels better, the lighting, you know, all that really matters a lot to me. Um, and that's how I see a lot of shape. So, um, yeah, that's why I like doing a lot of this stuff in 3d because I can see it. I can, it's like, I have a camera. Um, and I can just, uh, you know, if I put, if there's haze values in the, you know, in the viewport, even better, because then, then it's just like me looking through a camera and, and, um, choosing my angles and, you know, pointing light where I want it to go. Yeah. That's awesome. And right now, just, to, just for, uh, for some of you watching what's going on on E-Man's screen, he's putting his lights in, uh, and starting to light this scene the way you would light a set by, you know putting a, a box light up and shine or a spotlight and shining it down on a specific area. And he's adding a ton of different lights all over his scene to, um, to start to get the mood and illuminate it. Hmm. Um, yeah, Eman, I love, I love hearing that you studied photography. It makes so much sense watching, watching the way you work. Um, it's something that, you know, one of the, one of the really cool things about 3d is once you build your whole scene and build your world up, uh, then you kind of get to go around with a camera pretty much in 3D and and play with any different different lens that you want to play with and find the best angles to take a picture of what you've built in this 3D space. Yeah, because I mean, on this one, you know, like I think a longer lens kind of works. Um, so, you know, but I, I mean, I, I'll go, you know, I mean, 50 is a pretty standard lens, but, you know, you give it an 85, see what that looks like. And yeah, maybe that compresses it a little bit too much. So, you know, I, I, I like to be able to do that. And, you know, to draw that is difficult. It's really yeah. difficult. Like, like if, if you told the illustrator, say, hey, you know, I, I, give me a 24 mil. They, they, it's going to be a hard time. You know, <laughs> they're not going to like you very much. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's tough to draw uh, with focal length in mind. And I, I could never, because whenever I did that kind of perspective, I was like, oh, my God, just kill me. Yeah. I can't, you know. And that's, you know, that's one of the advantages I think of designing in 3D is that once you have a design that's working, if a director or a production designer asks you, well, what would it look like from this angle? You don't have to start from scratch. Um, you can, you can go and render another angle or you can quickly change a lens or, or make adjustments without, you know, if you were to paint this from scratch in a 2D program, uh, you'd have to start over to do that. So at this point, I'm just kind of trying to feel it and, and see what what I'm missing. Because I, you know, I know, you know, honestly, uh, you know, I would take it to a certain point. If I feel like I have all the shapes, then 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 I would go to Photoshop and start, you know, separating out and painting and all that kind of stuff. But you know, right now, I still, you know, you can't rush this process because um, you have to see, okay you know, like do the shapes in the back work with the front. Do I want you to see much of the back, mm -hmm. you know, or is it, you know, focusing more on these guys, you know, because I, you know, this is starting to look like it could be a really cool image. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Completely. But, but I also think, okay, the cooler it could be, the more attention it needs um, so that you don't kind of shortchange it. Because once you go, the, the trick is to know when to go from 3d to 2d. Um, that's always a problem because, <laughs> you, you know, inadvertently, sometimes you'll stay too long in 3D or too short. So you have to know when to quit and kind of move on. But for this one, there's so many line work uh, and all that, that I think being in 3D a little longer is good for it because, I mean, it's really hard to plot all this perspective. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and I, I feel like the background still needs some love. So that, that's where I'm going right now. 
Cool. Uh, well, we're gonna see. We're gonna see how far you get in this in the next yeah. ten Six, minutes. Sixteen minute magic. Sixteen here. minutes. Yeah. No worries. No worries. I mean, yeah. you guys can see where it's going right now. Anyway, um, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of getting there. Um, totally. I, I would play more with the focus on the trains and then the lighting, and it's too overall lit right now. But these are all things that you would take into, you know, passes, and then you would take it into Photoshop. And kind of dice it up and you know tune the lighting. I mean, you know, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. But no, it's, no, it's, please, it's great. Yeah, yeah. We we actually have some questions in the chat about lighting of whether or not you use HDRIs, and uh, um, maybe you can explain what an HDRI is. Well, HDRI is just a high dynamic range image that's got multiple exposures in it, so that um, it, it gives off the light at different exposures, so that it lights the scene realistically, just like that. You know, if you have the HDR of the outside or in the inside, you, you know, your anything that's rendered in there with that, it it will reflect and light realistically. I mean, that's really what it is. And uh, I use it. Yes, I I use it uh, for naturalistic scenes. But say for something like this, I, I don't know. I, I think it's so stylized on what it is that you don't really. Uh, you need a, a good sense of lighting, have bounce light and uh, lighting design, but. I'm not, in this case, I'm not using HDR. Gotcha. But normally I do, yeah. You know, when, when applicable, I will. And, uh, and we have a question. Do you start in black and white first for your lighting or do you start to light with color? Uh, it depends. Depends on what I want. Like for this one, I'm thinking, oh, you know, why not? it might be kind of cool with the sunset light, you know, or is it cooler with the interior kind of light like this? You know, I don't know. But um, I think for this, um, just for th this session, I wanted to limit myself to just, you know, values. Um, because normally I would use color, but then I would also throw a lot of textures on this and maybe I'd make this a real rusty kind of scene. I don't know, you know, I would try different things, but I really like uh, sort of what's, what's starting to happen here, but I would use a lot of haze. Actually, do you want me to just bring into Photoshop and just show what I would yeah, do? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's show. Let's rock it. I mean, yeah. you know, it won't be completed, but, do, you know. Do, do what you can. Yeah, well, you've, yeah. you've, you've spent it. Uh, I mean, I would do more. In, I mean, I'll finish it later on in 3D and then bring it in. But I think it's good for people to know what, they, what I mean by taking it to Photoshop. Totally. And get to see all the different stages of this, I think, is really cool and important. OK. So me... maybe explain just briefly about your passes here. Uh, well, I, I you know, I, I have a mask pass, but I'm just trying to see what I actually have. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I'll it's let I'll let Eman focus on getting this into 2D, and yeah. maybe I can I can do some explanation of what we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, you, you're through. the man on that. <laughs> Great. Um, so now that we're we're kind of we're happy with where the 3D layout is, and we're rendering it, which means we're calculating all of our light. Uh, we know what our camera is going to be to take the picture of the 3D scene. We know where our lights are going to be, and we know what the materials are going to be. We're going to hit render and actually save this 3D image out into a 2D image. Now, one of the nice things about using 3D like this is we have a lot of ways where we can take that 2D image and manipulate it. So not only can we render just what the image is going to look like, but we can render what it looks like with just one light and what it looks like with three lights or if we take just the trains of the scene and make them completely blue and everything else completely red so that when we're in Photoshop, we can easily isolate just the trains and just be working on those without having to you know, cut it out and then paint on top of it. It's already cut out for us. Um, or things like the haze. Um, you know, The further away from the camera you get, we can make uh, far away a different color than close up. And so what that allows us to do is start to play with depth in a scene and actual fake three dimensions in a painting, um, adding maybe clouds or smoke or steam or something in the background and kind of fading in closer to us. Um, so all these render passes that we have, we call them render passes. It's all these different uh, views and different takes on what that final image is going to be. And we're going to get as many of those as possible or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. choose the right ones that we're now, we know we're going to need so that when we're painting in 2D in Photoshop, uh, we have a lot of tools to play with. Yeah, I, I want more passes, but uh, I don't want to re-render this because it's, uh, it's going to take time. Uh, but, you know, some of the ZBEF pass is not set up right. And 
I just don't want to mess with it right now. So yeah, short, short on time. But R Rogery has has opened the floodgates for uh, for some Bob Ross talk here, because uh, you bring up a good point, Rogery. We got 11 minutes um, before the Bob Ross marathon continues. Um, and here we're going to jump right into Photoshop, uh, like you wish. We're going to do a little, some some happy little painting. Yeah, maybe maybe some some haze. You know, all, all the haze needs friends. Yeah, welcome a happy little tree to the sci-fi neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, just bring it in here. It'll be our little secret. Whatever you do, E man, we'll we'll, we'll keep it a secret here. All right. Well, we're just in like Photoshop that. now. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so here it is. T ten ten minutes on the clock, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this program, uh, Illusion, is called uh, Photoshop, um, and here this is a, a great digital, uh, th there's all sorts of things you can do in Photoshop, but one of the things you can do really well is paint, um, and that's what Eman is going to do here. Um, and you can see right now he's using a, a brush that has the shape of a cloud, and so he can use this cloud brush to, to quickly start to paint in some fog and some haze from that background. Um, and so very, very similar to, to the way you'd see Bob Ross doing this, um, he's on a, on a Cintiq with a pen, and, and you can see his brush strokes on, on the screen where the, it looks like it's the mouse, but it's actually a, a Wacom tablet and a pen that he can then paint all these motions, and you see him clicking through and changing brushes there. Um, so he can paint uh, the haze in here, the way that it's, it's coming through the light that he's already set, we watched earlier on this show, where he set the light using his GPU render. He put the light there, and now is painting through it. Passes are sucking, so I, I have the time to set it up, so I'm just gonna... <laughs> well, you're, 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 watching, it. you're watching a man move at, at light speed here, because if, in case you uh, are just tuning in with us right here at the, the tail end of this show, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the Kip Ash 3D Festival in conjunction with the Bob Ross Marathon. So the Bob Ross Marathon ends at 8 and will begin again at 10 p.m. And we are here to, to ferry you from one Bob Ross fix to another by showing you how digital art is made for your favorite movies and video games. And so for every Tuesday and Thursday from now until November 20th, we will be here in this time slot with some of our very good friends showing you how digital art is made. And tonight we're so very fortunate we had George Hull on the show earlier who has worked on Blade Runner and you know many Star Wars and and uh, uh, tons of different projects that we we went through earlier with and and heard some really fun stories uh, of his career as a concept artist and this is Emmanuel Shu who in this two-hour period has created this image um, and is is putting his final touches on it um, for this very well I'm just time. showing you guys <laughs> Ain't no final touch, man. <laughs> he's, wow. he's racing the finish line with eight minutes to go, and we're going to see how far of, into this painting he makes it. It is a challenge, a true challenge, to create a painting from complete scratch, no thumbnails, no ideas, completely winging it to an actual uh, painting in two hours. It's, it's insane. So... Uh, we're gonna see how far Eman gets into this, and uh, and maybe he'll post a, a cleaned up and finished version later on for y'all. And X metrics. How about how about some happy little haze? That looks that looks awful happy to me. <laughs> you see him there just beating the devil at him, Clean, cleaning <laughs> cleaning his brush right there. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I, I get I get what's, where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> we have to start to to ease back in. Yeah, we. Yeah. Have, to start to welcome some of these fine people to a new neighborhood, you know? And this here is digital art, and digital art needs friends too, just just like you, X, X Metrics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time. You know, I hope that you guys will stay with us through the month. We have such an amazing lineup of people planned to, uh, to come and share their insights and create some amazing work live for all of us. Um, we got some highlights like uh, like Ash Thorpe from Ghost in the Shell, uh, Jama Jerebev from uh, Jurassic World. We got some some big games people. We got James Pack from Titanfall. Um, uh, we got and on next week's show, uh, we've got Bobby Chu from uh, Alice in Wonderland, of course, and drawing tons of characters for Tim Burton um, and Peter Hahn. 
uh, the the great illustrator. Um, both those guys will be on the show with us next week. Um, check them out on Instagram. Uh, hit them up uh, if you want. Um, you know, put a comment in their in their feed saying you're excited to see them on the show. Um, Is that this Thursday? This that's Thursday, this right? Thursday, that's yeah. Thursday. So every Tuesday and Thursday from now until November twentieth. Oh, I, I guess you know you guys are pretty good on like you know that you know this is what some layers can do you know that's pretty flat but then you know that gives a lot more depth you know but of course you can do still a lot more but it's a good example for people who don't know hold on let's switch over let's yeah. switch over to eman's screen so we can there check we out yeah exactly what he's what he's showing us here eman can you do that one more time yeah so uh so this is you know sort of the straight render right here which is you know a, a little bit flat but you know, when you come into Photoshop, you can just you know give the layers a little bit of haze and adjustments, and it'll start popping the image uh, a lot more. I mean, this is still very, very rough and loose, but uh, you know, this is the beginnings. I mean, of, it's, it's, you know. it's so cool. It's like uh, <laughs> Sin City and Blade Runner had a child. There you go. Yeah. And so, so I mean, and, and I'll probably end up taking it to a color, uh, you know, image. Okay. And spending a little time and. Uh, you guys will have it. Man, That's awesome. I mean, so this is Eman's futuristic train station uh, that he made by turning some buildings on their side and using pieces of, of the Griebel's kit and the Gothic kit and Art Deco and some Neo Tokyo stuff in there. Um, literally, within this thing, there is a, just about a piece of every kit. Um, which brings me to, to one thing that I, I think is so cool, something that happened in uh, the festival last year. Um, that has been has been echoed again this year. We've gotten so many of our great friends and artists who, who wanted to, to come on the show and they said, we really want to be here, but let's also, um, let's give something to the audience. Um, and we said, that's such a, an amazing idea. Let's, let's do that. Let's give a, a coupon code to Kipash. So if you use the code Hull Shu, H-U-L-L-S-H-I-U, um, we'll put it in the chat here too. Um, from now until midnight, you can get any three kits off Kitbash 3D for the price of two. Um, so that is three kits for the price of two using the code Hull Shoe. Um, and you can grab a sample kit on our website as well, so you can try it out for free and start to play around and see if you can make a sci-fi train station of your own, um, as well as just uh, get a ton of the resources that we're constantly putting out there to help you guys grow as artists. Um, yeah. We're constantly giving out uh, PSDs from different artists who make the covers for, for the kits, uh, as well as our YouTube channel, which constantly is doing uh, either tutorials or um, you know breakdowns or making of videos, as well as uh, things like Eman's series, How to Be a Pro Concept Artist, which really dives into the business of doing this as a career. So needless to say, our goal here is to enable and inspire you to seek whatever kind of artistic journey you want. We, are, we find it our great honor to be, to be on this journey with you all, and we hope that you will engage with us. You can follow us here. Um, you can tune in with us again on Thursday, uh, where we have Bobby and Peter on with us. You can uh, engage with us on, on all the different social medias. Um, and it's my face back. <laughs> and here's, here's, here's Eman, perfect. Just uh, to say goodbye. Thank Eman, you, guys. thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I do I do one, one more thing right before we before we go one more thing I need to tell the audience about um, one of our, our our sponsors on this show is ArtStation. Um, if you don't know what ArtStation is, it is the essentially Facebook for digital artists. Um, I don't I, I don't know any digital artist who's not on ArtStation. Um, and what you can do there is you can create a really slick profile. Um, where you can put all of your images there together. Um, and what ArtStation has done uh, for this is they've given the code Kitbash Pro, which if you use Kitbash Pro, you'll get two months free of an ArtStation Pro account. Um, so go on for that if I- uh, Definitely make use of that because that's a very useful resource. Yeah, it is the go-to place where everyone puts their work now. You know, the, the in, including all the people from every major game studio and film studio that you know and love. Um, so with that, I know we got one minute until the the new Bob Ross marathon starts back up. Uh, Eman, thank you so much for joining us for creating an awesome painting. Um, yeah, yeah. Eman, it is it is 
always a, a pleasure and a great honor to to get to spend some time with you here and thank you so much for for sharing this with, with yeah well audience. thanks for having me man i enjoyed myself even though i didn't get to finish damn it it's a killer image <laughs> look I do, follow e-man on instagram by the way if you do do yourselves a favor and check out all of his amazing work and get get there uh interact with the stuff he's doing he's posting some of the coolest stuff out there and keep an eye out for the the finished piece coming from him and and thank you all for joining us on the on the first night of the kibesh 3d festival we'll be back thursday after the bob ross marathon at 8 p.m pacific time with bobby chu and peter hahn so now get your popcorn ready get your paintbrushes ready bob ross is coming back at you thanks everybody we out of here <laughs>